Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambodasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambodasa Namotasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambodasa Budang Tamang Sangang Namasami. Yeah. Welcome again to the Clear Mountain Saturday Meditation Group. And so, yeah, my name is Ajahn Kachana. I'm substituting for Ajahn Kovilo and Ajahn Nisibo, who are visiting uh, Shravasti Abbey right now. And, yeah, I Ajahn Kovilo is two monks junior to me in the Abhayagiri lineup, so we're we've been together for a long time. And... Ajahn Nisibo visited Abhayagiri when he was about three years as a monk, and then so we also know him, also know him pretty well. And there's, yeah, I guess what I'd like to, what I was thinking of talking about today is just what's what's been on what's been on yeah where I was la ba the last week, which has been on my mind, and that was, I think. I think people are aware that Ajahn, that uh, Ajahn Kovilo is going to college right now. And so it's his, it's his third, he's completed three years, has one more to go, and then I think his plan is to he be here more regularly. So that's why he's here because he's on summer break, and then he'll go back. So the, he's, the college he's going to is called Dharma Realm Buddhist University. And I... The last week, I was at a, a staff and faculty retreat for Dharma Realm Buddhist University. And I was the only one who had no real association with that organization, or no official association with that organization. So the Dharma Realm Buddhist University, that's the, there's a large monastery uh, about 45 minutes south of Abhayagiri called City of 10,000 Buddhas. That, that monastery is in the tradition of Master Xuan Hua, who a, a Chinese uh, Chan, which means Zen in Chinese, Chinese Chan master, who came, came from China deliberately, and his mission was to bring, uh, bring Dharma to the West. He started out in San Francisco with just a, what nobody noticed him until I think uh, a professor from Seattle um, a University. I, yeah, I think it was in. It's, I can't remember which one. If anyone, probably no one here knows Ron Epstein, but he found Master Shrenwa down in San Francisco. And realized, oh my, this is the real thing. We've got you know a master here, and he was living in a basement somewhere, and so he got eventually their temples you know got started. And things took it, things took off in quite a quite a big way, and they purchased the a mental hospital from the state of California up in up in near Ukiah. And later on in his actually towards the end of his life, Master Hua um, met uh, Lumpur Sumedho, Ajahn Chah's senior Western disciple. So people here are probably very familiar with Ajahn Sumedho, and there was a, an immediate connection. And that connection resulted in Master Xuan Hua giving, uh, it was about, it was a 120 acres of property to Longpur Sumedho. And that property became half of a Bayagiri monastery. So 
the, these traditions have shared these traditions have shared roots. Um, we're whenever they whenever the city of ten thousand Buddhas conducts ordination, they invite monks from our lineage to be there. And similarly, when I was a graduate student, physics graduate student in Berkeley, trying to uh, trying to, f I was very interested in Buddhism and really struggling with my graduate program, and it was. These two, these two traditions, City of Ten Thousand Buddhas and Abhayaguri Monastery, that I turned to, and I, f I went on a four, five-week retreat in um, summer of two thousand three, um, and that really, to see if I could, ha to see if I basically to see if I could hack it as a monk, you know, is it, I was scared, you know, is it actually something I can do? The answer was resounding, yes, I love it at the City of Ten Thousand Buddhas. And on that retreat, the, p the, um, mm. the leaders of that retreat are now more or less the senior faculty at the City of 10,000 Buddhas. And my peers are now junior faculty and staff. So the reason why I was there is I knew nearly half the people of the 19 participants. I knew nearly half of them and had known them for 20 years. And our connections ran deep. We, we, all, had, we all had decided in one way or another, that the Dhamma was the priority in our lives, because these are sm very, you know, very smart people. I think everyone in the room had a, everyone in the room had at least a bachelor's degree and could have done many other things, and they putting their energy into a what's now a very small and only just accredited, like five years ago, university project. Um, but that's. So there, yeah, there, and the setting was amazing. We were on a 500 acres of redwood forest down in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Master Hua had purchased it uh, decades ago to protect the trees. There's another 300 acre parcel also owned by the uh, City of 10,000 Buddhas organization. And so also my, two of my one of the one other of the people on that uh, 2003 retreat became a monk in their tradition, and he and one more monk are trying to start a monastery down there, and the 300-acre property will be a, a a forest monastery for nuns is the plan. So that was really special, um, just to. You know, my, my physics training does not prepare me to deal with the likes of Heidegger's being in time that they were discussing. And so I was, wow, okay, you know, I'm s smart, smart people here. Um, and so I wanted to share a bit about what they, what they, what we were talking about. Because, yeah, I mean, Master Hua, in a way, what, the... Yeah, Master Hua's vision, there's a phrase, it, it's called Dharma Realm Buddhist University. And Dharma Realm is intended to be an all-encompassing term, uh, very big. The Dharma Realm is the yeah, totality of experience. And in the notes, it's you could actually use it as, yeah, and it's actually, even though it's, labeled as Buddhist, they want it to be bigger than that. So the program that Ajahn Nisib, the program that Ajahn Kovilo is taking is a, it's a four years bachelor degree in classics, but it's both Eastern and Western. So there, it's like, I think there's other universities that teach the classics, I think like St. John's, but this one, this one they teach um, Aristotle, and Aristotle, Confucius and the Sharangama Sutra all right together. And the idea is that they are, yeah, they're looking for a, they're looking for a vision of what it means to be human that is greater than what the sort of modern imagination is. Um, I said, yeah, I, I said in, our, in a small discussion with Venerable Jin Xuan and Jin Wei, the two monks there, I just made the comment, yeah, we're, hmm. we're not human because we can play good chess. 
And they said, yeah, that's, that's right. And in a way, the modern, the modern, so modern visions of humanity are sort of like, you know, we're, yeah, we tend to emphasize our mental capacities and, you know, our cleverness. And we tend not, yeah, and we, but we don't have a vision of what we can, what, you know, we can, what we should be, what we can be intelligent for, what we can be, you know, what we can be wise for, what, what can human beings do? So a lot of what human being, a lot of what human beings seem to be doing right now is trying to make more money, which is not a what? Could do a lot more than that. But no one, you know, but no one, you know, but there isn't a vision that encompasses that. Um, the f yeah, Christianity is, um, has faded greatly in influence. Jesus was actually even harsher, much harsher than the Buddha in his critique of wealth. But not only did Christianity not always pick that up, now, now it's not even, you know, we're, we are, we're, we're occupying Christian buildings because there aren't Christians occupying them anymore. And so, yeah, it's shifting. And hopefully, you know, the idea is to, can in, in these traditions, can, they, they use the word humanism, you know, it, it is human-centered, but there's a different, there's a, diff there's a greater vision of what humans can be. And the more than that, there's <coughs> in the Buddhist perspective, it's not only a vision, it's a path. And there's things that you can do. It's cultivation. And the most, one of the most moving sessions was a senior disciple of um, Venerable Master Xuanhua named um, Professor Marty Verhoeven spoke to us about what Master Xuanhua said about the vision of Dharma Realm Buddhist University. And that what and from from that what um what Marty suggested was that we could take the framework, the Buddha the framework from the from Buddhism of uh in Pali, it's a sila, samadhi, and panya. So that's virtue, um, mental training, and discernment. Most traditionally, it's virtue, concentration, wisdom. But one of the, those probably aren't even the best translations of the Buddhist concepts. Virtue is okay, um, but integrity, um, honor, uh, there's a real yeah, integrity, honor, there's a real, it's virtue that uplifts the spirit. It's not at all, although one, although one follows rules, one follows rules because one chooses to follow rules and one knows the benefit of following those rules. And you feel, yeah, you feel the benefit of that. Samadhi, it, concentration is not a good that's a standard translation. Um, it's actually not a very good one. So, in my, my teacher, Ajahn Pasano, uh, will often refer to how words are translated in Thai, into Thai, because that's where he first learned Buddhism. And in Thai, samadhi is being, translating samadhi from what it's translated into Thai. It's the firm establishment of the mind. It's not, concentration is like Rodin's The Thinker. It's, hunch, it's hunched over, it's up in the head, and it's really, uh, concentration is what you need to, for example, play good chess. You know, being able to focus on single point, you know, what am I, what, uh, what's my next move here? But samadhi's not that. Samadhi is an expansive, relaxed, settled, um, it, it's one, it's one pointed in a way, but Ajahn Amaro says it's the point that includes, not the point that excludes. So it's, there's a point here, yeah, you're, it's settled, it's here, 
but this is that here includes all of experience. Bringing experience here in, in a settled, responsive place instead of going out to, um, and getting lost in our experience. That, that's samadhi. And one can, yeah, one can recognize the benefits of that in whatever one's trying to accomplish. It, you'll do it better if you're able to, yeah, respond from a place of, um, yeah, respond from a firmly established place. And then panya, um, often w the most common translation is wisdom, but that's not, that's not very faithful to the discernment is more faithful to the Pali. Because wisdom is something that you have. Um, you know, wis wisdom is something that you have or you get. And um, the panya is related to actually it's, it's, um, it's a form of the verb, jhana, to know, to understand. And so discernment is something you do. And, and indeed, it, it's being able to, it's being able to make skillful distinctions about what's going on and therefore make skillful choices about how to respond. This is, this is panya. And so what I've done is I've given, I've given Buddhist translations of these, which are very useful for our practice. But what Norma Realm Buddhist University wants to do is make universal translations of these, not using the Buddhist jargon that I'm saying, but explain how these are fundamental capacities of the human mind that, that when developed, make us um, both, you know, both more effective and more kind, more responsive in whatever we do. The, and so this, this is a challenge, and um, I must say, I don't think we, um, mm -hmm. it, was, it was just brought up, and they, they suggested beginning with sila, because that's, that's one of the hardest things to explain, because one of the things that Dharma Realm Buddhist University does differently is they don't separate the classroom and the rest of your university life, you know, I can, what, I, you know, I went to a university, I stayed away from, I stayed away from all the parties and all of that, but I certainly knew what was going on. And there's a, you know, there's a split, you know, you, you study, you maybe study, you know, what Socrates had to say about ethics in your class, but then, you know, you don't necessarily do anything related to what Socrates has to say with, about ethics on the weekend. Dharma Rum Buddhist University, um, says no, we, it's, it's an integrated experience. And so they have, they have some, it's a, a radically different experience at college. Um, this morning I just looked up their, um, I looked up their student code of conduct for reference. And among other things, like I remember right, the, um, what, no alcohol, no drugs. You know, and that's period. No, no visit. The the men and women are housed quite separately, and there is absolutely you do absolutely do not go into the dorms of the other gender. Um, and apparently, they picked up a model. There's a college in which that's an expulsion offense, and they copied that. So just absolutely off limits, which is I think helpful. And all, yeah, so you're, you're, you know, and there's a, there's a culture of just not, you know, this is not a time to be seeking your future mate here. Um, and then, let's see, right, they have, um, internet access is, um, in shared spaces, either in the, either in the academic buildings or the, or the dormitories. I'm not sure how well they can, you know, I don't know, I have no idea how well they can enforce that, but the idea is that um, these sorts of ethics, it's something you take on, only, you know, for your two or four years you're there, and you, you, you use it to 
increase your capacity to reflect. This forces you, forcing yourself to not be distracted means you can pay attention to your experience and learn something from that. So these are, so this is, this is, a, diff this is a different approach. And as I think it was, I think it was Doug saying, we have to, in our, we have to learn how to convey these principles in a way that we're talking about human potential and human human freedom, and now they're in these dormitories, which are like, yeah. I mean, he used the word gulag, which would be a you know a prison. It does. So it's if and oh, they could be perceived that way if you. Um, if you, you know, if you picked it up wrongly. So how do we explain that? And one, one of the key principles is understanding the difference between um, freedom to and freedom from. There's different, there's different meanings of the word freedom. And freedom to is what we're most familiar with as Americans. I'm, you know, I'm free to do whatever I want in the ideal, and certainly college students often try to enact that, and that is, that's freedom to. Freedom from is more subtle. It, freedom from is freedom from the compulsions that both cause us suffering and, and cause us to do things that cause more suffering in the future. Imagine being free from every compulsion that you have. That, is, and to me, I mean, I just, wow. You know, that, again, even when, even when I was young, I recognized I was interested in that kind of freedom. And so, freedom from, and I guess you can say that also, that is also a freedom too. Uh, if, you're, if you're free from all impediments, you're, li you're living at your full potential. And that's, that's a different model. Um, it's not, about, not so much about what I can get, but what I can give. And, it's a, um, and to be able to give is considered a tremendous honor and opportunity. So this is, yeah, oh. In a way, I think I, if if this program had been developed enough to have a seriously good science program, it would have fit me like a glove when I was 19. Um, I, I remember I was meditating and, you know, I was trying to meditate on the, you know, when the orientation week had their optional events, I'd try to go back to my dorm and meditate. I would have, I, 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 boy, I would have loved it. But the thing is, is that I'm, I'm what, rather unusual. So for most people, and even and even I need tra even I needed translation to understand the city of ten thousand Buddhas, because also this this massively broad vision is set within a they live on the same they live at the you know part parts of the university or at the city of ten thousand Buddhas, which is a um, it's a what it's a very you know it's a very culturally oriented form of Buddhism. Most of the, there's 60 or 70 mostly Asian nuns there who practice, and actually it's unfortunate in some ways, as a monk I don't actually really know what they practice because I don't, you know, everything is so separate. I notice that it's, um, I could probably, I could be talking, but it's not time for that. It's time for, uh, time for you to ask questions. So I will leave it at that. Let's see. 
Yeah, Gary, do I select who answers the, who asks the question, or does the mic? Great, that works. To what you're describing. Yeah, there is. Now? No. Hello? Can you hear? Um, what you're describing for this course mm -hmm. at the university reminds me tremendously of what used to be, I don't know if it still exists, what used to be the honors program at Seattle University. And I'm wondering if you're familiar with that and can make a comparison between the two courses. No, I'm actually completely, un I'm not a Seattle native. And so, yeah, I'm totally unfamiliar with that, I'm afraid. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see if it still exists, but I don't know. I'm a red-hot Roman Catholic from Cincinnati, mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful and thankful that I came here today. I am deeply devoted to Pope Francis and equally, and I think fiercely loyal to Thich Nhat Hanh and his memory. I have watched him, Thich, on YouTube from Plum Village since 2008, uh, The Art of Suffering, part one, for these many years, it has taken these many years for me to understand when I breathe in, to breathe in. <laughs> when I breathe out, to breathe out. What you did for me today is make me, I in a good way, acutely aware of my body of the, the teeth in my mouth, of my tongue, of my uh, elbow, et cetera, because I've, I've been consumed with other parts of my body, but I'm now aware of those, those other parts and am attending to those pains I hope appropriately, and I'm also the Twitter representative for Tent City 3 next door. So may I say for them, thank you for your kindness, for your hospitality, for not averting your eyes when you drive by. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, well said. Hi, Ajahn. I had a question about how you made the journey from your science mind to embracing ideas about Buddhism, for example, re um, rebirth and things that can't really be proven um, by science. Yeah. Well, we talked about that. We talked a little bit about that. Um, not that specifically, but the idea of methodology, we made a distinction in that group between method and methodology. Methodology answers the question in a discipline, what counts as evidence? And method is how you go about acquiring that evidence. And so right now, what's happened, with the, what's happened in the academic world is that they've taken one standard of methodology which is the sciences, ideally the hardest physical sciences, and said, that's the best evidence. You know, like physics, which I was. Um, make it like physics. You know, make it, make it, um, make it, you know, make it that solid. Make it, basically, make it only, whatever is accessible to the senses, whatever is, um, you know, inter intersubjective is a word, basically, what you can share with everybody. That's what counts as evidence. And if you take that as evidence, you don't find much of anything in terms of rebirth. But that's, what should we say? That's not the only methodology out there. And 
you know, one can ask why is, th you know, why, why is that one become so superior? Um, there's other methodologies. It's inner one of the reasons why Dharma Ram Buddhist University was accredited is because the academics have started to recognize that um, contemplative experience is a methodology. You, if you read something and meditate on it, you can learn things about that that you couldn't do just by thinking. And I mean, we know, in a way you already know this, how do you experience poetry? The best poetry is not, it's not by thinking about it, it's by feeling it, um, by letting it really deeply sink in. And when you start to, when you start to experience the world that way, then, um, then a whole lot of things become, a whole lot more things become plausible. You know, it's, the possibilities open up. You know, when one looks at things from the point of view, rather than, rather than imagining oneself basically taking the assumption that I am, that all I am, I'm my physical body and anything else must derive from that, you know, from that physical body, which is a bunch of atoms, whatever atoms are, and um, that's an assumption that is made for, uh, you know, in the physical and biological sciences. And it's, pro it's the right assumption for those disciplines. But it doesn't mean it's the right assumption to live as a human being. Um, if inside, we're much more than that. And what should we say? From the inside, uh, there's people have all sorts of experiences that are not easily explained by um, by our world of atoms and such. They're not. Repro they're generally not reproducible. So they don't count as evidence in uh, scientific methodology. But they're very real experiences. And so if you extend the methodology, you start to say, hmm, yeah, okay, there's, there's a lot, there could be a lot going on here. And again, I, you know, I, so what should we say? I generally follow, you know, I generally follow the uh, teaching, you know, the uh, teachings of the Buddha and the understanding of, um, of rebirth, uh, you know, but I certainly don't, you know, I don't have any objective evidence of that for sure. I don't know that, you know, it's hard to say, not clear that anyone does, although I, there are a few hints, but anyway. So let's see, does that begin to respond to your question? If not, then just uh, let me know what, let me know how I could help. Um, sort of. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's really not for me because mm -hmm. this is a question in my mind. It, this is a question because I have someone else in my life that asks me this question a lot, and I can never mm -hmm. like come up with an answer. Yep. Because they're phys they're also a physicist, and they yep. just want me to explain really how is it possible mm -hmm. that I understand that there's rebirth they, they, they cannot grip like how I'm sure about that and uh -huh. so that was why I asked the question and I'm not sure you yep. answered it but I, right. I, I think um, well I think I get the thing yeah, about evidence another so thing is is that to um, is that to uh, you know if this is like someone close to you like a spouse or something you can um, you could for instance suggest can they prove can they, uh, you know, can they prove to yourself that you love them? Try that. Try to get an empirical proof that, um, you know, that so-and-so loves you. Um, it's not, you can't do it. it it's, and, you know, there's, you know, you have, you have to take it on some faith. You've got probably some evidence for it, but it, and again, it's more of a, it's more of a, fee, you know, it's, it's not empirical. That's a, so that'd be, that'd be one way to, possibly approach it, feel it out gingerly. But in the other thing is you'll never be able to convince anyone. Um, it's, this isn't a, and what I, just my own personal experience is I find that it, my, my beliefs and perceptions around things like rebirth depend entirely on who, who I'm associating with. When I was with, a you know, when I spent a lot of time around a bunch of physicists, I was much more skeptical than I am now. When I spend a lot of time around people for whom, many of whom, all this is just second nature. I mean, one realizes that, my understanding in Thailand is that 
the, the perceptions that people have multiple lifetimes is just not very, it's just what everybody believes. You just have them. You might not know what they are, but some people think they do, and um, you just live that way. And so it's, a, and it's, just, as, it's just as much as uh, we have this sense that you only live once. Thanks. We have a couple of questions online. Yeah. Um, Joseph, go ahead and, and unmute, and you can ask your question. My question is regarding something you said in terms of freedom to and freedom from. I thought that was something that really just kind of sprang to mind as something important I wanted to ask you a question about. How is that kind of philosophy or that view of you know freedom from, how has that influenced, uh, for example, your cultivation of metta? in terms of, because I'm, I'm finding that there's the radiating freedom to love of all beings, but there's also the cultivation of freedom from harming all beings. You know, like there's a, this positive negative dynamic that I find is so important that it's not always about, because if I, if I say I gave you a gift, right? If I gave you a gift, my mind would go, oh, I should have given him two gifts. Oh, I could have given him three gifts. I could have given him so many more gifts. And then there's this endless kind of giving. But then when I say, oh, I didn't hurt him, then the mind is calm. There's like this absence of harm. And so I'm trying to cultivate, is this the, is this the good mindset for the cultivation of patience? Patience is a negative space. I will not let this, this is, there's a difference between loving kindness and non-hatred, like absence of hatred, absence of frustration. So, uh, what we will you've chosen our ending chant um so we're going to chant um yeah uh we're going to chant the um which begins may i abide in well-being in freedom from affliction and then goes on in freedom from hostility in freedom from ill will in freedom from anxiety and may i maintain well-being in myself and so that's absolute um, metta, freedom from ill will, freedom from hostility. And yeah, that's, that's a very good perspective on it because there's, I don't, I don't think it's possible to really, it's, I don't know if it's possible to have positive feelings towards everyone, no matter what they do. And if, even if it were, you could, it would not be at all helpful to try to force yourself to do that. But can you, can you abide in freedom from hostility and freedom from ill will? And the way to do that is to recognize that whatever ill will you have towards any person or any situation always harms yourself. And you can feel that. And so you abide in freedom from hostility and freedom from ill will, not as a favor to anybody else, but because you care about yourself. And so this, this gets pretty powerful. You, and again, that, that samadhi, firm it's something you can firmly establish the mind on. You know, yeah. both the panya, recognition that yeah, any ill will I have harms myself. And the samadhi, therefore, I will abide free from ill will. So, yes, your perspective on metta is very good there. Keep it up. Sadhu. Okay, now, Seth, why don't you go ahead and unmute yourself, and then we'll see if somebody in the room has a question before we go to Juan. Are you there? I said thank you, Cheryl. Sorry, oh, I wasn't yeah, okay. pushed gotcha. on, but <laughs> I'm used to being on your side. Um, thank you for the 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 talk and the um and the meditation. It was great. I have a difficult question, and I apologize. Um, I did go to Oberlin, um, so we're a little bit famous for disrupting spaces with our complicated questions. So. I, I'm dealing with a lot of aversion right now, just about the gender essentialism that's going on um, that you described in your talk, um, like the separation of genders at the, the university and monasteries, how 
you mentioned that you don't know what the nuns are doing except cooking. And I wonder what purpose does this separation of gender serve in the monastic tradition? And, and are there ways to, um, yeah, kind of, kind of ask questions about this and, and disrupt it in a way that's respectful of the lineage and the history, but also, you know, trying to bring it into sort of a more modern understanding and um, conversation about gender diversity and equity. Um, I asked a similar question last week, but I want to hear it from you. Okay, yeah. Well, yeah, you, so I don't know what the answer was last week, which is good. <laughs> so, yeah, the, my understanding is that the, the gender separation is primarily for simplicity. Um, I mean, I was, I watched myself, you know, I mean, what? I was, you know, I was one of, our, our DRBU group was half and half, men and women. And boy, I could, I'm a monk, you know, I train myself, but I could still feel it. I mean, the way I was looking at those women, I don't know how not to do that. Um, and it's, it's, I think, I think if, if I were to really master this practice, women would not be a distraction. But you know what? I don't know how long it's going to take for me to master this, to master this. And so in the meantime, we use a skillful means um, of, s and I agree completely. We, we have discussions about, um, you know, the challenges that, uh, that gay and lesbian monastics face because it's it's admittedly more difficult for them but i actually know some i i know some really good monks who have made it work um despite be, you know despite being attracted to men i haven't asked them how it works but i can tell from their practice that they have you know that they that they've they have made it work on the other hand boy i imagine that if, if I had, if I was in line, and part of me would just abs, you know, I would really like, I, I, I have this, you know, I would really like to have, in a perfect world, I'd like to have, you know, just monks, men and women living as monastics, side by side, to have, you know, the, the next one in line in front of me be a woman, and for me to have, and for me to be able to experience her as, my elder sister, and nothing more. I would, oh, that would be wonderful. But you know what? I can't do that. It just wouldn't work. You know, and she would probably have nearly the same, she'd have the same kind of motivations, the same kind of energy that I do, and gosh, if I got, you know, if I got disgruntled in this monastic life, I'd probably fall in love with her. And she might do the same for me. So this is, and so we use, we, use it as a skill, we use it as a skillful means. And monasticism is not for everyone, and it has never, it has never fit into a broader cultural context. Um, it doesn't, in a way, it doesn't really ask for acceptance. You know, some people, some people will appreciate what we do, offer us food, that's great. You know, other people will criticize monastics and stay away from us. That's not a problem. Um, you know, we, it's, it's a skillful means to practice a dhamma that we think, that we perceive as world transcending. But that also doesn't mean that lay people, you know, that people can't practice it in other ways. And I, I wish I could remember the name of the monastery but there, I, there are monasteries which are, have experimented with, um, I, and I wish I knew, there was a, there's a Zen monastery where they call both genders monks. And what I've heard is that they have, you know, there's, they've, got their, you know they've got their sleeping space and, you know, m male monks are on one half, women monks are on the other half, there's a curtain between them, and that's it. And this, this is in the Zen tradition, which has, um, 
in a way, much more freedom because they dropped the uh, Vinaya rules a long time ago. They can create something. And as far as I know, that community is, as, my, as, far as, I know, that community is doing well. So there are experiments happening. Um, but again, I hope, that, um, I hope that responds to your question somewhat. Yeah, it does. Um, and you know, it's, it's a version that I'm gonna have to live with and it might be something that's, you know, really is too much for me to bear, but I mean, it's, it's something I have to, to deal with. I did read Stillness Flowing, the Ajahn Chah um, biography, and he does get really explicit <laughs> about mm -hmm. his journeys with, um, with uh, attraction, um, mm -hmm. which I thought was valuable. So if anybody wants to kind of <laughs> read some more um, source literature on that. It's and yeah, I, I highly recommend Stillness Flowing as well for an understanding. That's probably the best explanation of monastic life in English um, that's available right now. Yeah, my only point that the reason I'm bringing it up, and I'm sorry to take up even more time, is just that I think it is a point of contention. It is a point that kind of distances and marginalizes some people. So it's something that I've been thinking a lot about, just about how to handle it in yeah. a graceful way where we just show respect. So thank you for answering my question. You're welcome. Okay, and then um, we have a question in, in the room, and then we'll go to you, Wang. And I'm going to let someone else call time here. So what, let the, organ, the organizers can decide when to quit. Okay, yep. Hi, um, first off, uh, just thank you for, um, for giving your time today to um, do a meditation and talk with us. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, I'm sure we all do. Um, I had a question about the freedom from and freedom to dichotomy that you talked about um, in your Dhamma talk. Um, specifically, um, I, I kind of get a sense that um, in, um, uh, for example, it seems like there's a common problem among certain people of, for example, like uh, a compulsion to fear criticism, for example, or maybe um, maybe a compulsion to um, uh, not be entirely honest about feelings or opinions or things like that, either as a, a defense mechanism or whatever. And I guess I was wondering, um, especially, um, I was wondering how, and I guess in more worldly terms, like how you can use that freedom to and freedom from approach and how to make sure you exercise discernment um, if you're reflecting on things and using that. Mm. Yeah, well, in terms of, yeah, so fear, uh, fear of criticism is, yeah, that, that's something to, in terms of working with that, you feeling feeling it in the body really deliberately um, you know when you recognize okay this this is fear of criticism what does what does it actually feel like in the body I mean it, it's not going to be pleasant but I can't tell you exactly you know may, maybe maybe tightness in the stomach but you'll have to see for yourself and then it's my suggestion be to work working with it on a bodily level that that's the fear see what it see what it feels like you know, invite that place to relax. And, and in a way, similarly for, um, similarly for, yeah, discerning when it, when is the, when is it skillful to express an opinion and when not, uh, that's a, that's a, because sometimes, sometimes, sometimes you're, sometimes, sometimes you're afraid to express an opinion and that's actually, one uh, very interesting group dynamic I saw, I was just, I, I wasn't saying much because um, I was, you know, the, not the one on the DRBU staff and faculty, and they were, they were discussing their university, not mine. But, but what I watched, an, in a particular discussion, the, the, the facilitator, I think it was, yeah, the facilitator, after some discussion, said, okay, why don't, why don't we hear from everyone who hasn't spoken yet? And so the mic got passed around. And just what I listened to, uh, it'd been a good discussion so far, but what I listened to from the people who hadn't shared was even more valuable than the ones who had been talking. Duly noted for group dynamics. Um, those people who are staying quiet um, may have some really valuable stuff to share. Uh, conversely, I also, read, yeah, I, and I was actually really happy that I kept my sharing short because the next person who hadn't spoken had something really important to say. 
but again, that was, that was because I was, that was, and so at that point, you know, yeah, just judging, it's, you know, not so helpful for me to share here, let someone else, and that, I was very happy with that decision. So, yeah, does that respond? Good, okay, great. And then we've got one more from online. Right. Go ahead, Ron. Hello. Um, so you were saying that um, the in intellectual side of us cannot help us leave a meaningful life, which I totally agree. But my question is about how did you use the analytical side of your mind as a monk? Because I know that you can't just rely on the monastery and the community to carry you to the finish line. It's still pretty much a personal journey. So like, how do you figure yeah. out what to do? Um, yeah. So yeah, using, using the analytical mind, the analytical mind is actually, it's a very, very useful tool but that's that's a th it's a great tool but if you ex but it's actually it's actually incapable of being the being the one in charge if you try to and i'm i'm this is this is intuition right here but if if you try to if you imagine that you put your analytical mind in charge what might well be happening is that you're following desires of some sort, but you don't actually, but you no longer know what they are. It's much, you know, so what you want to do is you want, you want to let your, and desire is not always bad in Buddhism. There's, there's, yeah, tanha is craving. That's the cause of suffering. In brief, tanha is, tanha is what addicts feel. You know, the, I'm going to get it, you know, I'm going to get this no matter what the consequences are. That's tanha. And I think it's fairly easy to see how destructive that is. Chanda is translated more frequently as desire. And chanda can either be positive or negative depending on its object. Very often positive. You know, may all beings, you know, may all, the, the, the desire, compassion, the desire to help comes from chanda. The desire to the desire to bring forth one's best potential is chanda. And so put, put that in charge and then analyze accordingly. Because then once, you, once, you've got, once you've got really wholesome desire front and center and let your analysis follow that and your analysis will be really valuable. You don't discard that mind. Thank you.